happy Easter. Good news. Jesus is alive. Amen. So that's exciting news. But we have other news, too. What else is going on in your neck of the woods? Hi. Uh, <laughs> we have prayer this Tuesday, but our group night will start April 15th. Um, you don't want to miss it. It is just an incredible time of just not only sharing together, praying together, talking about the word together, growing. It's just a really, really good time. So April 15th at 7 p.m. And, and next Sunday night, how many men in the house? How many men want to be in the house? How many of you know men who need to be in the house today? Okay. So next Sunday at 6 o'clock, the men are going to go candlestick bowling. See, that's what I thought when I announced it too. Yeah. I'm all about food. And they said, don't do food this time. Go do bowling. I announced bowling. Anyway, so 6 o'clock, um, it's at the, uh, where is it? It's where you go. Beside... They don't know where the gym is. There's a candlestick bowling place here in Bridgewater. We'll be there at 6 o'clock, but we, we, there's a limit of 10. We have five that are signed up, and afterwards, then we're going to Pizza Delight. So we're going to exercise and then get fat again. <laughs> so um, I do, seriously, I do need to know who are gonna, who's going to be coming. Um, so that's 6 o'clock next Sunday night, candlestick bowling for two hours, and uh, we're going to just kind of... I've never done that in my life. I, I did, like, bowling, bowling, but I don't know nothing about this stuff. So that ought to be a good joke for myself because I'll probably stink at it and be the laughing stock of everybody, all the guys here. So It's okay. Hmm, the bowling what? balls. What did you The bowling about? balls are really light, so you'll be able to throw it. You know? Oh, it's throwing, <laughs> throwing. Anyway, let's all stand. Come on, let's celebrate the risen yeah, Savior yeah. today. Amen? Hallelujah. Lost my 
was buried beneath my shame. And who could carry that kind away? It was my dream till I met you. I was breathing but not alive And all my failures I tried to hide It was my too Till I met you You called my name And I ran out of that grave
Jesus. Jesus. Father, we are so grateful that you are alive today. For those that are afraid of death, those are the ones that are bound to earth. Those of us who are bound to heaven, death is nothing more than a comma in the story of life. I thank you, Lord, for what you did. I thank you for what you're doing. I thank you for what you're about to do. Ha! You are still in the about to do yeah, business. Lord, thank you, Lord. Mm. <laughs> I like that song, Ain't No Grave Gonna Hold This Body Down. And I can't sing, but it does sound good. Oh, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Bam. Hallelujah. I wasn't supposed to do that. I'll take it back. Hallelujah. Well, you can be seated if you can. I love watching Bobby Joe play bass. I didn't get any jelly beans for Christmas, but I can watch a jumping jelly bean up there. That's, she's got more energy than the Ever Ready Bunny. And, uh, I used to like seeing bunnies at Christmas. Now I'm like, them stupid things. Easter, yeah. In Psalm 121, um, just go here for a second. He says, um, I lift my eyes to the mountains. Where does my help come from? I mean, quite often, we, whenever we're in a time of help or despair, we need something from God that we have a tendency of looking to everything and everywhere but God. We look in our own abilities. How can we make things happen? He says, my help comes from the Lord, the maker of heavens and earth. And he'll not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. In other words, I like that part because he doesn't sleep when you are. He's always trying to find an answer. He is the answer, but he's always trying to get an answer to you. He's always working on your benefit. Indeed, he watches over Israel with neither sleep nor uh, slumber nor sleep. And the Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. And the sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm, and he will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going, both now and forevermore. I love the fact that he's always watching, he's always ready, he's always willing to help. And we have a number of giving stations that are out there, and, you know, some are here, some are online, and I get excited about, you know, I get excited about giving unto God, period. And, um, you know, we, we, uh, we're, we're really jacked, we're really pleased by, what, by what's happening, and for some of your givings. It's just been amazing, you know, where you're at, where your treasure is, where your heart is, and uh, so we always get blessed by that. We always look for an opportunity to give. I can actually recall back in the day when we had a separate account, like a checkbook, just for giving. Like, we would always take our 10 or 20% from our income, and we would always, as soon as it came in, we would deposit it into our giving account. I don't know if you ever had a giving account, but if you ever have one, you should get one. It's awesome, because you're never in a situation where you say you can't afford it, or you can't give, or whatever, because you always have an account there. And I like it, because if you put it in an interest-bearing account, then you gain more on what you sow it in there, and it's always good. So, um, bless you for those of you who are giving. Um, now, I want to dive into this thing here today because how many have enjoyed the Resurrection series? I, I really have, and uh, not that I need your applause, but more of it would be great. You know, it's just, just stop, just stop, just stop, put, stop with the applause, just stop with it. But last week, um, I, I did this message on the day the shouting stopped, and yes, I guess that means all the kids and teenagers can go. I did this message on the day the shouting stopped, and I found that It was interesting when they were shouting, Hosanna, 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 and they were laying down their clothes, they were laying down palm trees, they were laying down branches, they were welcoming the king. But how many know those who have a tendency of being the loudest are not always the most loyal? Those who have the biggest lip service are not always the ones that are the most loyal. And they're shouting and they're shouting until, they're, until a sacrifice had to be made. You know that the Savior was the sacrifice, but I find that it, that it was interesting that when they were shouting 
and Jesus was on the cross, everybody was in silence. There, none of his friends were there except John. But what I found that was interesting, John and Mary and Mary Magdalene and a couple others, but what I found that was interesting is, is when Jesus, the ultimate sacrifice, was laying on the cross, he was still giving instructions to, to Mary and John to, to take care of people. I don't know if you ever noticed that part on there. It wasn't like, yes, I mean, I know he was going through the agony and all this kind of stuff, but he was still sharing. He was still, he was the ultimate sacrifice, but he was still sharing. And so I talked a little bit about that, that day, the day that the shouting stopped. And then Friday, for those of you who missed Friday, uh, you just missed it. Um, I don't know how many of you are here and you know what I'm talking about. If they, if they missed it, just say, you missed it. Friday, I did a message called Creating a Cross Culture. And I said, don't ever underestimate the power of the resurrection because without the cross, there would be no resurrection. And without the resurrection, there would be no hope for a reformation. That there comes a time when there is a dying to ourselves and a dying to our desires and a dying to this kind of stuff. But the fact is that God did something just so powerful on Friday um, that I, 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 I kind of knew that it may happen. That message I hadn't preached in probably 18 years, 17, 18 years, but felt led to, to do it and probably won't do it again. So if you missed it, you missed it. Too bad, so sad, you're dead. Uh, but it, it, was, it was, you can watch it online. That's why we record stuff. So you can watch it, but how many know you can watch it, but it wasn't quite the same as being here? The Sunday school teacher was extremely enthusiastic. She looked at the class of four-year-olds and asked this question, does anybody know what today is? The little girl held up her finger and she said, yeah, it's Palm Sunday. That's fantastic, the teacher replied. Does anybody know what next Sunday is? And the same little girl held up her little finger and said, well, next Sunday is Easter Sunday. Again, the teacher said, that's great. Then the teacher said, does anybody know what what makes next Sunday Easter? And the little girl again responded, and she said, well, next Sunday is Easter because, because Jesus rose from the grave. But before the teacher could again congratulate her, she continued, but if Jesus sees his shadow, he has to go back in for six weeks. <laughs> That's not true, but it is kind of funny. Corey Ten Boom, how many know heard of Corey Ten Boom? Corey Ten Boom, that's what she did when she got those 10 candlesticks. She went, Ten Boom! Anyway, uh, uh, wah, wah, wah. yeah, whatever. So Corey Ten Boom was asked if, if it were difficult for her to remain humble. And her reply was simple. She said, Jesus rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday on the back of a donkey, and everybody was waving palm branches and throwing garments on the road and singing praises. Do you think that for one moment it ever entered the head of that donkey, that any of this would have been for him? She said, well, if I can be the donkey on which Jesus Christ rides in his glory, then I give him all the praise and all the honor. I mean, you know, sometimes God will just use us donkeys anyway. And I get excited about when I hear stuff like this because, you know, I really just want to be used by God no matter what way. If I have to carry the glory, I love that, that we're a mobile tabernacle of the glory of God carrying the very essence and presence of God himself. I can be a donkey for Jesus. I don't have a problem with it. I don't need to be a stallion. I, I mean, I don't need to be stallions. I don't, know, I don't need to be those, quiet, those crazy wild Mustangs. Wild Mustangs, those are those that, are, that, that, listen, a wild Mustang is a horse that has never been broken. And I have a feeling that sometimes God uses those broken vessels because wild stallions are always in it for themselves. They always want to see what, what it's all about them because they've never really, really been broken. But today, I want to talk a little bit about grace. I want to talk about regenerating grace. Ephesians chapter 2, if you have your Bibles, I want you to go there and, and I want you to I want you to hear the words that I'm going to emphasize, all right? I want you to hear the words that I'm going to emphasize in Ephesians chapter 2. And the first point 
on Easter Sunday morning is this, that his regenerating grace... We forgot the video. <sighs> Can we do it now? Or is it too late? It probably doesn't have it. Oh, never mind. Anyway, I just looked at I just thought about that. We had this cool little video that all my points were arranged around the video. I'll do the video. Oh, that really, that helps now. <clears throat> anyway, we're back to the thing. His regenerating grace changes everything. So let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. You can get it out of your phone Bible, or those of you who have memorized the entire Bible like Glenn, then just open up your chest and read it from there. So Ephesians chapter 2, and I want you to hear the words that I'm going to emphasize today. He says, as for you, who's he talking to you? As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live. You were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us lived among them at one time. One time. All you Bible-believing, tongue-talking, Jesus-saved freaks, at one time, you used to be different. But now you're different. All of us who live, well, let's just do it again. As for you who were dead in your transgressions and sins, in which you used to live, which tells me if you're still living, if you're, if you're still living in the past, then you quite possibly could not be maybe dead to your transgressions and sins. In which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the rulers of the king of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those are disobedient. All of us lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and its thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature, deserving of wrath, but because of his great love, because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us dead. Oh, come on. Made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in, in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. Those who are alive are dead to sin. Period. That's what I'm thinking. And I was reading this in verse 4 when it says, but because of his great love. I just told me God loves big butts. I don't have much of one anymore, but I used to. God loves big butts because whenever you see a butt, something big is about to happen. Look at it. Find it in Scripture. Almost every time you see the word but because of his great love. Dead to sin, you used to do this, you used to do that, you do, but because of God's great love for us. The recession, the virus, your unbelief, disbelief, or opinions will never change God's mercy. It doesn't matter if you agree or disagree, you'll never change God's love for you, nor his mercy, but God's grace for Bobby, but God's grace for Cheryl, but God's grace for Ryan. But God's grace for Tori. That's his wife. But God's grace for Denny and Kristen and Oakland and Rezzy and Mikey and Cody and Destiny and all the other grandkids to come. But God's grace for us made us alive in Christ Jesus. That's a good word. That's a great word. It's awesome. The moment that you said yes to Jesus, it unlocked his resurrection power. The moment, the instant, the very second that you said yes, 
to Jesus. It unlocked his resurrection power. It is by his grace alone that we are saved. It is not achieved. It is received. Jesus worked for it, and he paid for it, so we didn't have to. I don't know why we, quit, we keep thinking that we have to keep working for something that God already gave us. I was writing this stuff down this morning, and I, and I had to just put this on here because there's a lot of people that are looking for validation. There's a lot of people even now that are looking for approval, and your validation is found from the cross. Your validation is found from the cross. Everything that you require as a needy person. I'm not needy. Well, just the fact that you said you weren't, you are. We're all in need of something. We might need money. We might need love. We might need affirmation. We might need appreciation. We might need confirmation. Whatever thing that you require as a needy person was provided out of the passion for us from the cross. That's a good word, because if you can't get that validation or approval horizontally, which we always look for, you know that you're going to get it vertically from the cross. So stop looking to people to do what only God can and did do for you. Now, I wrote this on my Facebook this week, and I was a little challenged. So a lot of this message here today is coming from stuff that God's been dealing with me with. And a lot of this stuff may not even be, your, your walk with God may be so beyond what I'm about to tell you, and good for you. But this is something that was for me, that God has helped me this month to put things in proper perspective, and I'll just tell you what I put on my Facebook, for those of you who are Facebook freaks. He said, I felt that I had to repent for running around after recognition as my reward to validate my value. Some of you are looking for validation in all the wrong stinking places. It's not the rewards. It's not the trophies. It's not the accolades. Oh, most likely to succeed. Good for you. Oh, you got the ribbon. You got the reward. You got the plaque. And you got the... Good for you. Some of us are running after all that stuff. And for me, I had to say, you know what? No more. Because that took many, many years to get that revelation that my reward is well done, my good and faithful servant, and my value was demonstrated on the cross, and my life's calling is now to demonstrate it. To demonstrate God's love. And I wrote this this morning. It's crazy. It's right, it's right there. It says, I searched for approval from those who did not have the authority to give it. I searched for approval from those who did not have the authority to give it. They might have given their opinion that matters about three cents. But they don't have the authority to validate what God already validated on the cross. Oh, my God, Jesus. Philippians chapter 2 says, Therefore, if you have any encouragement from being united with Christ... If any comfort from his love, if any common sharing in his spirit, if any tenderness and compassion, then make my joy complete by being like-minded, having the same love, and being one in spirit, and being one in mind. Because there's a unity, there's a bonding that begins to take place, like I said, the very moment that you say yes to Jesus and no to yourself. And I have to go back to verse 6, if we can find that, that slide back there in verse 6 of Ephesians chapter 2, because I found something in here that I haven't really seen before, and it was something very significantly supernatural for me in verse 6 it says and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus now I don't know about you but don't ask me how but somehow supernaturally we are situated here on earth and seated with him in heaven at the same time I don't really, I can't explain it. It doesn't make much sense other than I have to take for what it says. It's like, it's like earth is not our home, but a timeshare or a rental facility. 
This is, not my, this is not my place. Millions of people have encountered the risen Christ, including many of you and myself. And the fact that Jesus was raised from the dead testifies for eternity that you are now right with God. You're not going to get right with God. You're right with God. Now you're seated with him, which blows away all the you're bad, you're this, you're that, you're this, you got to perform, you got to jump through all these hurdles, you got to do all this and all this to even get God's attention because he's too busy creating stuff to be bothered with something that he already created that you're right, that you're justified. And when Jesus came out of the tomb with resurrection power, it was a statement. It wasn't, yeah, it was part of the plan, but it was a statement, not just for the followers and the doubters, it was for the present and future believers who were spiritually dead. That he gives you the power to come out of the tomb of death, decay, and denial. When something significant happens that you're raised up with him. I don't know. I don't know. I think some people just enjoy the grave too much. They just enjoy the old life. If I were to ask for testimonies, I've been asking for testimonies. And the things that I like to hear is what God is doing now. For God's sake, not what he did 25 years ago. That's not a testimony. It's a story. I want to know what he's doing now. What did he do this week? Give me a testimony. It's awesome. I'll give you a testimony. You want one? I'll give you another one. So I'm at work. And I was, I was thinking this week, and I told Cheryl, I said, you know what? For months, I've been complaining about work. I've been complaining about work. Oh, I don't want to be there. Blah, 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 blah. Some of my greatest testimonies happen at work. So I got thinking, is my ministry limited to a pulpit? Or is, my, or is my ministry being propelled to transform a place? And this couple came up. I won't tell you who they were, but this couple came up, and they lived in such and such city, and they moved to such and such city, and we just got talking about stuff. And then I just, I just tested the waters. How many know God's going to, listen, God's going to call you not to put your toe in the water and test it, but to put the toe in the water and make waves? Some of you are so afraid that you're going to make so many waves that you're going to offend somebody that that you just don't do anything. And you feel that I'd rather just stay in my little cave with the tomb, you know, and just sit there and just, oh, lions, tigers, and bears, oh my. And you're just so afraid. And you haven't opened up your eyes to realize that Jesus rolled away the tomb already. He rolled away the stone already. He's telling you to leave. Get out. Get out of the way. Oh, no, I like it here. E.T., phone home. (laughs) If I stay in here long enough for another 25 years, the the rapture's going to come. Poof. And I'm thinking, what about all these? Here's that Glenn thing again. I'm thinking, these 25 years, what could I be, what could I be accomplishing? I know some of you hate the word doing, but what could I be doing? For the next 25 years when I'm so afraid. God's not giving us a spirit of fear. But he's given us a spirit of love and power and of a sound mind. And so I'm talking to this couple. And, and you know, I invited them. Obviously, they, they didn't come. But the, the point is not they didn't come. Because how, for, for some people, the biggest accomplishment in your life during that week is if you just invite somebody. But some of us have this whole Messiah syndrome on our shoulders that feel that we feel that we have to reach the entire world for Jesus. All you have to do is get people to make a decision. That's all you got to do. It's not up to you to disciple the planet. Because some of us have a hard time discipling ourselves, much less our neighbors. But we have all this guilt. And we're walking around with all this guilt on our shoulder and guilt. I got to do, I got to do, I got to, you just got to be. If you just be Jesus, then the opportunities are going to come. And so I'm looking at my work and I'm thinking, oh, here I am complaining, when in all actuality, that's probably one of the biggest ministries that I've got. That I get to demonstrate Jesus in front of a a bunch of people who really don't care. That when I have my customers, I know when to shut up. I know when to be Hondaized. I know my restrictions, but I also know if there's a crack, I'm going to take it. 
And then I find out that most of the people that I go in and, and take that crack, they're not offended at all. And this couple wasn't either. I showed him this really cool tattoo that, that, that I don't have, but I showed him this really cool, and he was like, wow, that's awesome. And I'm like, whoa, he just thinks that's awesome. Well, let's talk more about Jesus. And it just got to be awesome. So I know that they're looking for a place and they may even be watching online. But the point is God puts people in front of us all the time. And it's up to us to seize the opportunity of a lifetime during that lifetime of the opportunity. But if we look at our relationship with Jesus simply as a religion, it will restrict us. Robert Kappen says, Religion is, is an attempt on the part of human beings to establish a right relationship between themselves and something, that, and, and something outside themselves, something they think to be of life-shaping importance. And this life-shaping importance, this religion on the outside, it can take the form of good behavior. It can take on the form of a code of conduct or, or a personal set of ethics or life principles. Anything can be a religion. And if you don't mind, i got to really stick real close to these, these notes because I'm going to go on a thousand Easter bunny trails. When religion is our focus in life, we end, we end up living very restrictive lives. Our focus becomes rules and regulations and, and our own performance and our own evaluation of ourselves and others when we just totally rely on that. The bad part of religion are the rules and the regulations, the stipulations and the do's and the don'ts. The codes of ethics that if you keep them, you'll convince God to love you more. Hmm. And some may even try to use the code of ethics as a bargaining chip to manipulate God not to judge you in this life or the next. That's the challenge of relying specifically on just religion and the code of ethics. And if we live our life solely on religion, then our life is narrowed down to its rules, its dress codes, its hairstyles, what you drive, where you live, and even what you eat. Because even your diet can become your religion. Matter of fact, why don't we just say even you could be your own religion? Because the very moment that you worship you more than you worship Jesus, then you become an idol. Oh, God bless the reading of the Lord. The problem is, we constantly evaluate ourselves based on how well we obey those rules, don't we? We've always done it. I did it. And we then condemn ourselves and even worse, judge others for not keeping them as well. And then we start buying into self-justification that justifies our actions or our lack of based on the performance of others who failed. And we always get challenged in that area. But Matthew comes along in the Message Bible, and I love this in verse chapter 11. He says, are you tired? Are you worn out? This is so relevant. Are you burned out on religion? Hello. He says, come to me. Get away with me, and you'll recover your life. He says, I'll show you how to take a real, te- a real rest. Walk with me and work with me and watch how I do it. Did you ever think that Jesus ever got stressed out? I don't think so. Remember the old shirt that said, I'm too blessed to be stressed? I think sometimes stress we just put on ourselves. We put on ourselves because we feel like we have to perform instead of just being in the place of receiving. And he says, watch how I do it. And watch this. He says, learn the unforced rhythms of grace. Learn the unforced rhythm, rhythm of grace. That I won't let anything heavy or ill-fitting on you, he says. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Lightly. I like that thing, lightly. We learn to live Lightly. Some of us need to learn how to dance in the spirit again. It may not be that, and that's fun. But some of us just and just some of us just need to lighten up. <laughs> Tanya's right. 
Ray's form of relaxation is... <laughs> I pick, I love you, you're awesome. The two, <laughs> it's so true. The t- <laughs> I just pick on you, man, but it's, uh, it is so funny. Well, just look at yourself in the mirror, it's just hilarious. <laughs> the tomb that represented death, listen to this, now becomes a womb to give life. Jesus, our Redeemer, changed religion in the relationship and rituals into righteousness. It's amazing, guys, when you grasp this, how life-changing this will become. Romans says that Jesus was handed over to be crucified for the forgiveness of our sins and was raised back to life to prove, to prove that he had made us right with God. Not that we make ourselves right with God. He did it. By what he did on the cross, Pastor Carl Thomas, one of our mentors and and, and really father of the faith, he said, because Jesus was raised for our justification, we don't need to spend our time, our energy, our efforts trying to keep the rules and convince God to bless us or change his mind about hurting us. The resurrection declares we are right with God. Now the essence of our life is not to prove ourselves to God, but to live out of a relationship with God. I love that phrase. I love that statement. That our essence in life is no longer trying to appease and please God by jumping through hoops of repentance week after week after week to get it right to do what he already did on the cross. That we need, we need to let Jesus take the load of religion off our backs. And I promise you that when that happens, you'll not be bent over carrying the weight of the world every week when you come into church. Some of you come in here, you're like, oh my God. You're walking around like you're just handicapped by the weight of the world. And you might have had a crappy week, and I get it. You might have had a week that's just not been all that great. But Jesus not only changes our life, but he improves our face value too. It's awesome. Second thing, his indwelling grace changes everything. His indwelling grace changes everything. That God always wanted to be with us. In the Old Testament, his presence was always in something or on something like a temple. However, now you are a temple of the Holy Spirit, and he wants to dwell in you. I love when I see... um, Sister Joy over here, whatever. Jean Ann. I got a new haircut, and the, de- and the guy did his line in there, and he cut out part of my brain. So <clears throat> I saw, I felt all the stuff. I said, what are you doing? And he said, oh, I went too deep. I said, oh, my. When I see her, it's like, holy moly. It's just like, it's like glory. It's like the presence. It's like, it's like. A senior Jesus. I mean, it's, she shows up in the room just, she's just little black. You, you, you can have the place completely dark and Jean Ann shows up. Pff, I mean, even the light bulbs get excited and they break. I mean, it's exciting because the joy of Jesus rules, reigns, is resident inside of this woman all the time. And I love hanging around people like that. I'm sorry. If you're coming in, whoa, whoa, whoa. Jesus changed, how about this one? Jesus changed my life, and you can look like me too. (laughs) Wake up, stop that. Galatians, I've been crucified with Christ, and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And I do not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. I don't set it aside. This was something that Jesus accomplished so that we could accommodate it. The hero of redemption and resurrection is the Father. 
This is not recreational religion. This is a resurrection reality and a redemption equality that his grace is available to everybody and it's not something that I set aside Monday through Saturday and put on Sunday to appease everybody. His grace is for me. I, I, he achieved it and I received it. Grace is the synergistic union of the natural and the supernatural. Think about it. Empty hands I bring simply to the cross I cling. I am not in this phase of life. It's not a, it's not a, I don't know what it is. It's not a midlife thing because that's, that's, that's even weird. But I'm, I'm in this, well, well, I'm in this transformation. I'm not in a phase. How many of you, if you're in a phase, it'll stop and you'll go back. But I'm in a continual transformation. And I said it Friday that I'm really no longer content on just making people happy. But I do want to challenge people. I'm not afraid to confront the very things that you're afraid of. I've had people this the last week, they're like, oh, so-and-so's house is possessed. Pfft, let me at it. It won't be any longer. That you get to the place where you realize if greater is he who's in me is greater than he that is in the world. Is it just a cute phrase in this phase that you're living in? Or is it a reality that you've adopted and that you've received and you, that's engrafted in your spirit? If it is, it doesn't matter what the boogeyman says. I don't care when and who the antichrist is because I'm not phased by that. He or it should be phased by me or you. Stop with that stuff. I don't care if he comes from Rome, Italy, or Rome, Georgia. It doesn't matter to me. I'm like, oh, you? Just like it was in, where, where Glenn, in Scripture, where it talked about uh, that somebody saw, I forget, you'll help me out, and they saw the devil, and they were like, oh, it's just you? <laughs> Why do we get so worked up on a worm? Stop that. John 17 says, for you granted, I'm almost done, for you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So eternal life comes. Listen, listen. This is, you don't ever you can forget anything I said. Don't forget this part. Eternal life comes from that indwelling relationship with Jesus, not from a set of rules. Where, where was it? Let's go back. He says, now this is eternal. What's eternal life? That I may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you sent. Eternal life is relationship. Listen. Because I've been barking on rules, and I've been harping on rules, but then I wrote this this morning, that rules free us, not bind us. Sometimes... I'm not talking about religious rules, but sometimes there's guidelines. I mean, no, God sets up guidelines. Rules are there to protect us, and, but not bind us. They're there to help us, not harm us. But some of us, we get so hung up when we hear the word rule that we feel that we're so restricted and we can't do. Rules are not not like that. If we look at a rule as something to help us and guide us, then things begin to change. We should never be bound by the shackles of religion because Jesus freed us from the things that Satan bound us in. He already made us in right relationship with him, so we don't have to, we don't have to keep trying to earn it. And, 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 and write, just write this down, and you can get it in the notes. But we've got to stop trying to be through religion what we already became through the resurrection. We've got to stop being through religion what we already became through the resurrection. Christianity now is about wearing on the outside the image of God or what you already bear on the inside. Oh, my gosh. Ephesians says, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. I was just thinking about all this stuff this week. I don't know, this has been a really weird week. I was sick for two days. I worked all week, had two sermons. She's sick, 
And I'm like, oh my gosh, what a weird week. And it's one thing, it, it's hard enough sometimes to put one message together, Andrew, but two, I'm like, yikes. And I'm like, holy macaroni and cheese, it gets weird. But I was thinking about this, how many of us are ready to change passports and take on a new identity? Change passports. What do you mean by that? That we, are, we identify way too much to the citizenship of this place, of this earth, of this world. That we are not, we are not, we're in it, but we're not of it, but yet we're called to minister to it. We need to change our, our passports and change our identity. Inhale his presence. Exhale his love. Relax and be refreshed. Relax and be renewed. Relax and be restored. Just chill. Chill. Give your face a chill pill. Some of our faces are so stressed out. Man, you got wrinkles giving birth to wrinkles. Man, you're like, oh, my God. I love that word restored. I had to look it up. It means to, re to return, to return someone or something back to its former condition. A place or a position to repair or to renovate. So as to return to its original condition, the building has been lovingly restored. I love that word restored because I think about the temple and I think about us. That if Jesus changed our temple, why are we continually smashing it apart? That he restored this thing. He made it brand new. He, 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 he brought it back to its original form and its original function. And this is what happens the instant. Everybody say the word instant. The instant that Romans 10, 9 comes into place where it says, if you declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Bam, done. Instant that happens. Which leads me to the last thing. His sustaining grace changes everything. Changes everything. By receiving his sustaining grace. Can you go up there in a second and do that sustain pedal? Can you just, just, just go? Just. How, do, how do we gain this, this, this rhythm of grace? We do it by just hit any note, no matter what it is. Maybe an angel note, that'd be good. Just hold that thing. It's sustaining. It's that sustaining grace. It's that, it's that note. It's that sound. It's that something that resonates, that it upholds you. It lifts you up for as long as it takes that you go from simply surviving to thriving when you embrace the sustaining grace of Jesus. Do a note that's just boop, 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 boop. Just boop. Boop, boop. No, like this. I mean, that's how most of us live our life. <laughs> bump, 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 bump. One trouble after another. Bump, bump, bump. One problem after another. Bump, bump. One hiccup after another. Oh, I sinned. I sucked. I'm going to hell. Bump, 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 bump. It's a sustaining grace. Give me that note. It's a sustaining grace. Holding on to what is safe and predictable and maintaining that status quo is no fun. Some people are so much in control of themselves that they are afraid to let go and dare to see where the current of God's sustaining grace is going to take them. Those people are safe with ankle deep, knee deep, uh, 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 waist deep experiences, but will never go where their feet can't touch the bottom because their grace is boop, 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 boop. They want to be in control. But it's his sustaining grace. And honestly, I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's because of culture, occupation, upbringing, pride, whatever it is. But Romans 8 and 11 says, that's good, Cheryl. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead, if? If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, then he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who is in you, that this resurrection power gives you the strength. Can you turn me up? Because my, this resurrection power gives you the strength to do and to go and to be what you could never do in your own ability, the sustaining strength. That's why Paul prayed in Ephesians. It's up there. He says, and what is this exceeding greatness? Or can I just use the word sustaining? 
And what is this exceeding, sustaining greatness of his power towards us who believe? That according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, that you have been engrafted into this instructable life force. Membership has privileges. Membership has privileges. And I don't want to extend your dinner time, but let me just tell you this, that very few realize the revelation of the resurrection personally. Very few of us realize the revelation of the resurrection personally, that we rise because of our Redeemer's regenerating grace. That when you're beat up, His grace sustains. When you're down in the dumps, His regeneration grace will help you rise. And we rise because he rose. We rise because he rose. Humanity was made with eternity in our hearts. Birth with a desire to not only live forever, but to make a contribution to life that will last forever. Jesus called it the fruit that remains. Come on up, show I'm done. We might call it legacy, we might call it longevity, but Corinthians says, the fix your eyes not on the seen, but on the unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. I listened to a message this week from Zach Sloan. He's uh, one of the pastors at Impact Church in London. And it just seems like, some people say, well, what do you do all week? (laughs) I sell cars and do sermons. Cars and sermons, cars and sermons, sermons and sermons. That I'm always feeding myself. Always. I'm be like, where do you get all this stuff? That I purpose, ask her. I purpose in my heart. I schedule my time. Before, before I take care of this thing in the morning, then I have my devotions while I'm getting everything ready. I'm listening to, I'm listening to podcasts all day long. I'm at work. People are like, what do you listen to? You know? shake my body to the ground. I'm just listening to sermons. I'm listening to podcasts. I'm listening to, I'm listening to people that's going to feed me. And then I get home and I have my dinner and it, it, feed, it feeds me here. And then I, t- I eat a little bit and then I take what's left over for lunch the next day. And then I get for the next hour and a half or two that I'm getting ready for another sermon. What do you do? How come you can't get a hold of Pastor Bobby? Because I'm getting sermons ready for you on Sunday. And then I spend the next hour and a half with her. And then I go to bed and start the routine all over again. What do you do all day? Walk in my shoes. You'll find out. Zach Sloan says this. He says, without a hope in the resurrection, this awareness of eternity and the desire to do something that lasts turns inwards and becomes selfish, temporal, and afraid. We become painfully aware of our own mortality and we become bound by a sense of urgency. We become consumed with what we can do that we think will make the biggest difference in this life and we make decisions that are designed to be celebrated in this life in front of as many people as possible with the biggest impact that we can see as possible. Because quite often everything that we do revolves around us. And when you see through the lens of resurrection, you get to make decisions and contributions to life with eternal consequences in mind. I challenge you today. Challenge you today. Did y'all get something out, a little bit out of all this kind of stuff? I challenge you today. Let the Spirit of God rejuvenate you. Let the Spirit of God, for some of you, resuscitate you. Just because you died to the world doesn't mean that you have to look like you did. I can't believe I said that. Let me just say that to those who are watching online, nobody here. Just because you died to the world doesn't mean that you have to look like you did. I encourage you. When you're out in front of 
world. You're in front of friends and people. Look alive. Not like you just got grave clothes still on. Not that you do, but I'm just saying it generally. If you've never given your life to Jesus Christ today, I encourage you to do so. If we confess our sin, I mean, a sin is anything, good or bad, that'll prevent the flow of God in our life. It's anything. It's not just all the big stuff. It's anything. If we confess our sin, I'm trying to figure out how do I want to say this. Um, if whatever it is in your life, if you question whatever it is in your life that you might think is sin, it is. How's that? You don't need an angel to tell you what it is. Because you have this thing called a conscience. Which in actuality is the world's definition of the spirit of the Lord. When the spirit of the Lord convicts you of something, that may be sin to you, but it may not be sin to your neighbor. Hmm. Confess our sin. God is faithful. God is just to forgive, not condemn. Some of you are so wrapped up in John 3, 7, uh, 16 that you forget 17. We all love that one. What's 16? For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believed in him would not perish but have everlasting life. But 17 says that God didn't send his son to the world to condemn it, but that the world through him might be saved. If he's not going to condemn you, why do you, quit, why do you keep condemning yourself? Why do you keep condemning the very thing that he hasn't condemned? If you confess your sin, he's faithful. He's just to forgive you and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So I'm going to do what I haven't done in a year and a half. And I don't, I'm, not in, I'm not one of the ones bow your head and close your eyes because my thing is like if you can't, if you can't, do that here with a bunch of loving people, then how the heck are you going to do it out there where they really can't, they might challenge you. But I'm going to ask you with every head up and every eye opened, if you have never publicly given your life to Jesus, you've never received, listen, you've never received his forgiveness. Oh, you might have received church membership but you've never received his forgiveness. God's forgiveness is way bigger than your doubt. Because some, of, some people watching online right now, you think that your sin is way too big to forgive, and you think that he can't see it when he saw it long before you even thought it. So there. Put that in your pipe and smoke it. You've never publicly given your life to Jesus, but you say, you know, by raising your hand, you say, yep, Pastor Bobby, pray for me. I'm not going to have you come forward and, you know, get a bunch of Kleenex and all that. Just, yep, I, my life is so screwed up. Can we just put it in Bridgewater terminology? My life is so screwed up. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know where I'm going. I've tried this. I've tried that. And, and I just feel miserable. And I'm here because it's Easter. And I may never see you again. So that's why I can be a little bit more bold. Because I'm, no worry, I'm not worried about you being offended. Because I'd much rather you be mad at me now for telling you the truth than be mad at me later on for not telling you the truth. All right. On the count of three, if you've never given your life to Christ and you say, hey, that's me, just raise your hand. We'll pray. And believe God will do the work. Amen? One. Two. Three. Anybody? Thanks, sis. Anybody else? Tell me your name again. Jessica. Father, Jessica, do me a little favor. Hang on, guys. Don't attack. Jessica, just put your arms like this, please. Okay? That is symbolic of God's love, God's arms wrapped around you. Whenever you see the cross now, when you ever see this part here, 
That's his arms. Copy your arms. Father, I thank you, Lord, for Jessica. I pray, Father, now that she receives by faith forgiveness, big word justification. All that is is that, you know, he loves you. We'll just put it that way. That he loves you. He loves you, girl. I thank you, Lord, for forgiveness. I don't know the backdrop. I don't know the story. I don't need to know the story. You know the story from the end to the beginning. And I thank you, Lord, that you are restoring Jessica. Matter of fact, you've restored Jessica. She's just coming in awareness of it. Love on this girl. The times where she's feel, felt unloved. The times where she's looked at places for it. Lord God, and maybe it's been empty and maybe it's not been there. But Lord God, that you're wrapping your arms around her and you're wrapping around your, your arms around everybody else who is watching right now. And you're wrapping your arms around everybody else who is here today. God, that we receive it. We embrace it. We thank you. God, that she, Jessica and all the rest of us, we are dead to that old life. The very moment that you accepted Jesus, bam, brand new life, brand new, brand new. Don't even try to go look up the old person. You might even need to get a new driver's license because you're looking at that. Who's that? I don't know who that is. Let's get a new picture. Father, we honor you. We bless you today in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. All right.